Welcome, everyone. My name is Curtis Dunn. I work as a materials coordinator in, in the Grand Forks District, and and uh, I'm going to present on uh, a project that we did this summer, uh, Highway 81 and, and 17. Uh, they were tied projects. And uh, so there was a lot of different uh, special provisions uh, on, on this project. So this particular project uh, that we had this summer was located up north of Grand Forks, actually near the Grafton, North Dakota. Uh, there was a project in 81 that went from Minto to Grafton, and then there was a project on 17 that went from Grafton to the Red River. Uh, this is just a kind of a close-up of that again. This was a mill and overlay project. And so the first thing we had to do then was was uh, mill the material and, and, and two inches off, and the contractor milled those milled that and brought the pile to the plant in which it was uh, um, processed. And this is uh, an actual picture of the, the material being um, brought to the drum dryer uh, where it's, it's, it's brought into the, to the wrap collar. So here's the, just the photo of the, of the milling operations as it was going on. And so, Getting into this now, this was, uh, I think, between the two projects, we're close to 60,000 ton. So here's a, a photo of Highway 17 prior to the uh, project, prior to any milling. And you, you can see it was starting to get pretty distressed. The, it was, uh, the ride wasn't very good anymore due to the, the thermal cracking, the transverse cracking. And the same with the project on Highway 81 had the, as you can see from the photos, it had the thermal cracking. And that if these cracks continue through the years, they just seem to to get worse and worse and the ride gets worse and worse. So uh, the whole thought was here to to mill it off and 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 uh, get a new ride back. So just a photo of the uh, of the paver as it was going on. There's another one here. Uh, one of the things we used on this project that uh, has been, been being used here in the last maybe three or four years and it's really gaining popularity is what they call the notched wedge joint. Here's a uh, first pass of the notch wedge joint. So it kind of extends out about a foot from the actual pavement, and then there's a roller that goes over it and compacts it right away. After the pass, there's a second pass that goes over it and puts another layer over that first pass there. And the result is the joint is almost horizontal. Here's a, a photo of one of the cores that we took on, on the notch wedge joint. You can see it's, uh, it's, it's almost horizontal as it, it goes across the core. And that's about a five inch core there. So now we're gonna get into some of the uh, things that we've been doing in the last five years or so at the, in North Dakota. And it's increasing now. It's a lot of intelligent construction things. Uh, has to do with uh, intelligent compaction and paver mounted thermal profiling. And uh, we also had some uh, from materials and research came out and did some some of the sections here with the uh, the uh, rolling density meter. And so here is, you can actually see from the, the intelligent compaction uh, equipment, uh, the GPS equipment and things of that nature that uh, was used on the project that, that each of the rollers have. And this is the the paver 
the paver mounted thermal profile unit that's on the in the back of the paver which actually uh, uh, records every square foot of pavement uh, as you're paving and uh, tells you what the temperature was at that particular time and here's just a video of that you see the camera going back and forth there and that's recorded and we can look at that through a, a program called beta along with intelligent compaction and it's a it's a it's a lot of data but it it's able to organize it where you can uh, get some use out of it uh, for either forensics or sometimes even in soon enough where you can actually make some decisions as to maybe what you could do to uh, correct some situation out there. And uh, it, it's pretty sensitive in, in uh, detecting any kind of segregation that's going on. Uh, the contractor can actually watch this when they do have the time to, to um, watch it actually on the paver also. This is almost basically real time. So As I mentioned earlier, Materials and Research was gracious enough to come out and uh, do some um, experimental work uh, that they've been doing for the past few years with the uh, dielectric profiling system, which is the rolling density meter. And this is a non-destructive way of, of uh, determining what the density of the pavement is. And what's neat about it is that it covers the, the whole uh, mat and not just a core uh every once in a while and so this is really uh something that we're really looking at and maybe perhaps someday we can even use this as acceptance and here's a video of that john stork was out and uh, to do this actually on highway 17. and so there's here's some so that actual data along with intelligent compaction and paper mount thermal profiling can be can be imported into the VEDA program uh, where we can look at uh, you know a lot of history that went on uh, a few years ago we really didn't know anything about the pavement except uh, maybe some densities along the line but now we know something about every square foot of pavement we have out there we know how many times a roller went over it uh, we know how what what roller went over it, what time it went over it, how hot was the temperature when it went over it, uh, all kinds of things. And in this case, uh, just for purposes of uh, you know, just for information, um, this particular job had uh, it, the measured compaction or specified density on the first twelve foot from the center line out, which was your your driving lanes and anything. Uh, after that the shoulders are ordinary compaction so they don't really require uh, uh they don't really specify how many passes you need to put on there but there is a there is a specification for it but uh in this case there was a lot a lot fewer passes on the shoulder and so we actually thought we, we thought we'd take a, a couple of cores one at mainline uh and also, which is an actual random core that we take. And then we took an information core uh, right next to it, only uh, at, at least at the same station, but but only in the middle of the shoulder. As you can see, the, the shoulder asphalt compaction was about 88.8. .8. And that may have be largely due uh, to just the fact that there, uh, the path, there wasn't near as many passes uh, on that area and maybe the temperatures had something to do with it too maybe being a little cooler uh this is a an image from the thermal camera as i mentioned earlier uh, kind of in the same area um i don't think that paver stop had much to do with the densities there but it's just to kind of to show you that the paver there are that the beta program can actually show you paver stops and sometimes they do have an influence on things so um, here is some of the actual data that John uh, produced uh, while he was out here, uh, collected, 
And this shows up in the beta program also too. And you actually that core is actually showing up as being a lower density in the in, with the dielectric profiling system. Uh, just another picture there of of John. And uh, here's a here's a, I believe this is fairly close to that area again. And there's that paver stop. As you can see, the um, there are more passes kind of in some of these areas here. Not so much at the paver stop. Now I don't know why. Maybe there was just a uh, rollers got out of sequence there a little bit, but as you go down into the the uh, rolling density meter data again that John had uh, collected, uh, you can see the uh, density kind of lightens up there in, in some of those areas uh, where you have more passes out here where it's uh, kind of a more of a magenta uh, color. You can see that the that the densities get uh, more out in those areas. Uh, same here, uh, and you see this all the way through. I mean, I, this is just a, port, a snapshot of the VEDA program, and uh, as and, and a lot of cases, uh, like at the bottom here, you have the breakdown rollers. If you've been out on projects before, you've you've seen where the contractor will uh, maybe pick a four or five hundred foot section and go back and forth, and then they'll once they're done with that, then they'll move up and do the other another four hundred foot pass or whatever. But in that process, they usually try to double in the border areas at the beginning and the end of these segments, they kind of double up a little bit. Uh, they don't really want to, uh, you know, they want to make sure they keep uh, overlapping so they don't miss anything. But sometimes it it, it uh, ends up with more passes. And so you can kind of see that is affected by how the dielectric profile is just on the top there. Uh, so that's something that we've been seeing quite a bit of. Here's another one that we had on this was Highway 81, kind of the same thing where we out on the shoulder. This was a six and a half foot shoulder and the main line core wasn't right next to it, but it was close to it. And we had a 96.7 there, but yet where there's lower passes, we see an 88.7 on that. Uh, E-ticketing was another thing we had on this project. Um, and I don't have a lot of slides other than what was uh, the the person that was actually counting the loads and and recording the loads and as they come along. Uh, this was kind of the 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 uh, system that they used uh, with their iPads. And you know when a, when a truck would would come on to the scene or onto the area there that they, they would actually record that or or on the uh, iPad. And this is the project engineer, uh, Lynette Stain. And behind Lynette is uh, Todd Mansell from Caterpillar. Uh, Todd was very gracious to come up and spend the entire day with us. He, he always benefits people by uh, all of us from coming up because he has a lot of really good knowledge. And uh, we're always glad to have Todd come up. And he actually brought uh, with him some uh, uh, a video or a thermal camera that can record the images, both video and um, stills. And so I'd like to kind of share some of that. So this is a video of just behind the paver and shows the different temperatures uh, as they're going through. All the rollers. Uh, this is a uh, just a photo here, but you can tell uh, sometimes the when the truck, um, like a belly dump or something, puts out a windrow, it may sit for a little while, and you can see that the 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 top the kind of the surface temperatures were a little bit uh, a little bit cooler than when it actually gets uh, augered into the paver where where you get into the the deeper part of the windrow you can see that the it starts to get a little bit warmer again so the it, these uh no matter depending on how much time there are that, that it has to sit uh, it, will, it will cool some of course and this is just a typical photo that uh todd took from behind the paver but with the camera that he has the thermal camera you can actually look at the thermal image as well 
And this has a really, I thought was a really good one because it uh, showed how uniform the temperatures were across the mat at that time. And so um, we also, we weren't uh, sure what station that uh, it took that. And I wanted to uh, kind of verify those temperatures and things in, in the actual uh, intelligent compaction and the paper model thermal profile that was there at the time too. And so we had to, you know, we knew what time the picture was taken uh, that he had taken there. And, and so we could actually go into the VEDA program. And that's one, one of the options that you can, they have what they call a time filter. And you can put in a certain temperature, even down to five minutes. And so we could pretty much pinpoint at that time when that picture was taken, you know, and, and those were pretty uniform uh, pictures there too, you know, with, with the uh, VEDA camera. Here's another one. Very good temperatures too across the mat. And here's a, another one where uh, Pod was demonstrating his newer, new uh, handheld uh, thermal camera that you could actually put on a cell phone. And so he was taking a picture of uh, taking the photo of a uh, paver stop that had just happened there. And uh, that's what that's the image that he had there. And that uh, the, the, the brighter parts there is, is, is the screed that's sitting on the paver while it's stopped and that's heated that that always stays heated so the you know anything before that or after that is is cooling down but the but the the screed stays heated it's the video of it has a video of it as well and i pinpointed that paper stop in there too so the yellow areas those are like in that case the paper is going upwards there I believe uh, towards the top of the screen, and so the yellow part there behind that blue paper stop there—that's the actual screen, and that's up into the twos, you know, seventy-five to three hundred range. So now we had a lot, so quite a bit of performance testing, something we hadn't done before, and we're, we're great, uh, very grateful that we have the opportunity to have uh, materials and research uh, bought us, uh, purchased for us an ideal CT and an ideal RT testing equipment. And so we took some of the material off of Lynette's project there and we, uh, Arlene Norris uh, works in the lab with me here. And we actually made uh, several of the uh, specimens um, as we show right here. And these are like 61 millimeters high and they were made with the gyratory. And so we took these then and we ran a an ideal CT, which is a cracking test. So there's Arlene running that. And this is supposed to be, you know, uh, a test to determine how resistant the, resistant the mix is to cracking. And this is what it looks like afterwards. And we also ran the RT, which is a rut test on the on the uh, material as well. And you can actually use the same unit, only you just have to do a few little uh, adapters to put on so that you can run a, for the rut test. So here we're doing this as well, our lady is doing this one. So this kind of puts more compression on it to, to, to see how susceptible it is to running on the on the on the mix. There's some of those after they after we do that. This is some of the numbers we got, which I didn't think were too bad uh, as far as cracking and running numbers for both the crack test and the and the rut test. And this is uh this is wasn't on. This was the next project we did on on uh, after the seventeen and eighty one project. We did one in town, and all the paving was pretty much done at night. In fact, uh, just about ready for sundown here. But that's when they started to pave because of the traffic and everything. But there was still enough traffic to deal with. And they did a lot of what they did echelon paving, uh, where they actually you can see actually two pavers working there. So that was a way to eliminate that little joint there, whole joint. So it takes a lot of uh, coordination to do something like this in the middle of a busy street. 
especially around the signals areas and stuff. And then um, also this will sign some of the operations that were going on in, uh, in the nighttime. Plant. And this is uh, just the front end loader, um, making sure all the bent splints are uh, have material in them. This is one of the main the main workhorse really for this for these projects. And one of these is usually enough to do it, but they have to really be busy and and to keep up. So this is the finished product of both those projects. It did not, doesn't have the permanent striping on yet, but uh, it has all the rubble strips done and the temporary striping. So as I mentioned earlier, we had quite a few special provisions on this project. And uh, uh, the one that we really haven't talked about yet, but it was the percent within limits. Uh, that was something we've been trying on a few projects for the past few years. And and so it really, uh, percent within limits is, is kind of, is based on the idea that with everything you do as far as material, there's some variability. And there's material uh, variability in the material itself and, and the process of it and the sampling or the testing and the sampling. And so percent within limits is an improved way to measure quality in asphalt pavements. It, it captures both the, the average or the mean and the standard deviation of the data set. So not only do they want a good average, but they want a really narrow uh, variability there um, in one single quality measure. So PWL specification encourages contractors to produce a uniform quality mix and offers rewards or penalties depending on the quality of the work produced. The North Dakota DOT's current density specification is based on an average of the paving lot. So most of our projects are this way yet, uh, meaning the contract can receive full payment for meeting density when many of the cores could potentially fall below the desired target value. So you could have a wide range if you if your minimum density out there is 92%, say, and that's where you fell on with your average, you could potentially have you know quite a few that are under, and of course a lot over. But with PWL, it's a little different thing. And uh, it really encourages having the average, say, if your minimum density is 92, you want to have your averages around 93, maybe even 94, so that your bell curve falls within all of that. And so this is our, we have a special provision for that. And I'm just going to kind of go through um, a little bit of kind of the mechanics behind you know, how you figure that, if you ever have to figure it by hand. And so it's just basically statistical uh, formulas. And, you know, we figure out what, uh, like in this case, so this is just a typical day that we had on that project. We had six cores done. And you can see just by looking at them that they're, they, they don't vary very much, you know, not even uh, one and a half percent in some cases. So there was a really, well, I guess there's a close to two, I guess, or more, but 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 still, that's really, I think, pretty good. So, you know, what what you want to find is the average, and that's what we've done here. And then from there, we we need these uh, formulas successively because now we'll, we're going to do the the uh, the standard deviation, and then you go on through and you figure out your upper quality and limit and your lower quality limit. And as you can see, there's a, our upper specification limit, and I realize there's a lot of terms here, but the upper specification limit is 97 and the lower specification limit is 92. So you want to keep all your cores uh, within that range if you can. And so using the standard deviation um, and the average, we can figure out what our uh, quality, upper quality limit and lower quality limit, which we have at the bottom there. And then we take that to a graph or a table that was this kind of, uh, it's more of a standard. I think a lot of people, a lot of states use this, this uh, 
this this table. And what we want to do is we want to get um, a, a quality index from it. So I have a close up of that. And so in our case, from some of the figures we took from the previous page, uh, we've got uh, a upper quality index and a lower quality index. And what we're looking for is is a uh, percent within limits. And so we 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 take the numbers off the table. Sometimes you have to inter interpolate, uh, and you you get these numbers: the PL, P sub L, and then the the P sub U there. And you bring it over, and they have a formula. It, it's the quality level. So it's the P U uh, plus the PL, which in both cases from the table was 100. So your quality level is 100. Now the very last step here is we have a pay factor. And that's what determines if there's any incentive or disincentive that the contractor will get. In this case, the, the formula is 55 plus 0 0.5 QL. So you put that 100 in there and you end up with a 105. So the contractor will actually get a 5% incentive on whatever bid he bid for the project. And so that that's the best you can get, actually. And that's kind of what the bell curve looks like. So you want to have everything, the bell curve, pretty much uh, everything within the upper limits, like the 92 and the 97, and then you should uh, you should do pretty well. And so that's all I have. And uh, thank you for participating today. So.